Hey, welcome to The Fireside. My name is Jake, and this is the latest installment that you're about to watch or listen to of our uh, new illustrative series where we are trying to kind of dive into the minds of some of my favorite uh, illustrative style tattooers and just kind of tease out some similarities and differences between them all, uh, identify their processes, and we, um, uh, we have a great one uh, today. All of these are really great because all these artists have been incredible, but um, uh, today we have my buddy Cooper, and I first met Cooper uh, doing a guest spot and podcast series back at Guru Tattoo three or four years ago, and he's been on the show actually before. It was really an awesome episode, and if you saw that one, you know Cooper is very much about his process. He is very thoughtful, uh, he plans very thoroughly, and he is extremely process-oriented. So this episode, if you're curious about how really high level illustrative style tattooers uh, plan their tattoos out and execute, um, th this is the one for you because Cooper has a very specific kind of order of operations that he goes through with each and every tattoo. Uh, I don't want to say too much about it because I want to let him talk about it. Uh, real quickly before we get started, you can support us in a couple of ways now. One, by supporting our affiliates, uh, buying the stuff that you're already buying, but with a discount. So if you're buying stencil paper, if you're looking for a new tattoo machine, uh, if you're looking for tattoo education content or management, uh, studio management software, all of those things you can get at a discounted rate at our affiliate links in the description below. One other thing though that I'm really excited to tell you guys about is uh, the pre-launch of our newest course, my newest course that I've spent a lot of time on and my great friend Scott has spent a lot of time editing uh, and it is called Fireside Simplified. It is about limiting your options in order to make uh, better tattoos, more dynamic designs, uh, and just being more efficient overall. So that sounds a little bit confusing, I know, but I think it's a, a really, really valuable course. It will be to a lot of people. And if you'd like to learn more about it, it hasn't come out just yet as of the taping of this, which is oh, August 20th of 21. Uh, it's not out just yet, will be available within the next month, but there is a pre-sign up list if you'd like to be notified when the course is live and be one of the first ones to get to uh, to get your hands on it. Uh, to just uh, sign up at the link below, enter your name and email, and we'll let you know whenever it is live. And uh, we'll be talking a lot more about it in the meantime. That's it. I don't want to spend too much time selling stuff. Let's get to this episode. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you guys for supporting what we do. So who who all is in the uh is it just you in the studio or how many how many stations do you have how many artists? Oh yeah, it's just me. This is uh it does happen to be a really cool spot but it's it was really just meant to be a temporary get up because I'm, you know, likely heading out of town to Denver full time for too long. Uh you know, kind of in the middle a weird middle space. I left Guru and I want to go do some guest spots and traveling and see a bunch of other artists and uh you know of course we all saw COVID coming right so yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah plans are just kind of up in the air for a minute so I'm just making the most of what I got and I'm still hoping to spend a lot of uh time as soon as things uh kind of relax maybe just a little more and you know I know clients can feel comfortable going to places where there's more people and then I still want to do some of that because I feel like I got a bucket list of uh artists I want to work with and get to see a little more before I leave San Diego you know this place is uh we're pretty lucky here as far as the, the amount of uh, just awesome people we have here. So I kind of want to soak that up and not feel like I have too many regrets when I leave. Yeah. What, what size is the space? Am I looking at most of it behind you or is it, is it a decent sized place? Uh, yeah, it's actually, uh, you're looking at it in the shorter of the two directions. Oh, wow. Huh. Yeah. I mean, it, I think with the camera, the way I have it set up and the, the lighting, it probably looks like a lot more than it is. It probably looks way bigger. Yeah. Uh, but it is enough uh, space. I got a studio to the side over here, which is a, a nice, you know, luxurious studio for one guy. Or, uh, you know, you could probably squeeze two guys in there if you're feeling ambitious. I, I might do that if I uh, have a friend come in or something. But yeah. um, other than that, you know, it's it's really basically just making do with the space I have. And got lucky coming in here. I think everybody's kind of getting on the private studio uh, wave lately. It seems it's like in the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like it. we had a, a, a talk on uh, maybe one of the, our Monday morning drawing groups about that, about how some of the really like epic, like legendary shops that were just known for having great artists coming through uh, are um, like that, that concept is kind of going by the wayside in some ways, because a lot of the great, best artists are 
deciding to kind of move off onto their own, you know, you, yeah, you see it's a just lot so of much to manage. I, yeah. I feel like it's probably the kind of thing that goes in waves and popularity. You know, there's, there's natural cycles of these things, you know, it's like you want to have all these super shops. It's like a, like a super band, you know, you find uh, so often there've been amazing super bands for rock bands and they get all the best guys together. And, you know, it sounds like a great idea, but then all the egos can't work together. They just don't sync up. Right. And it just never really kind of turns into something. I, I feel like the, uh, the shops that are amazing are as much luck as they are like diligence and planning, you know, well, like I know I was a guru and there's was and is a lot of great artists there, but uh, mm -hmm. it just ends up being so much to manage. It, it, you kind of feel like, you know, I feel like there must be something similar to like a, basket yeah basketball yeah basketball or basketball team mm -hmm. that uh it does really well and you know you always have um kind of the star players and everything but then you have all the other players who just sort of sit and watch everything go by and i think most of us who end up going to other shops end up uh not always being sure where you're at or even if you are in kind of the star hot seat for a minute it doesn't feel like you thought it would and it, it all ends up being more to manage so i think it's one of those things where net naturally these cycles get so busy with big shops and big egos and, you know, big talent usually to go with it, but it gets to be so much to manage that the next wave is, you know, everybody just kind of do your own thing. <laughs> you know, everybody yeah. just chill and just do your own thing. And then, you know, I think it's probably good for the industry as a whole because, uh, you know, first thing you can think of going to a private studio and it's definitely my first concern is that I get bored, man. Mm -hmm. I love it. I, I'm, I wish I'd done it years ago, but I also, think either way that i i don't know if i could do it for more than a year or two because i love working with my friends and i love working with uh you know other guys keep new ideas coming in and keep you on your toes in a bunch of good ways too aside from just the social part of it and uh i feel like that's a big part of not just the um you know the draw to the job but almost kind of what makes the tattoo experience what it is even for the clients yeah you know? it's, it's something that that i think that you um that the longer you go into private space, you really feel it lacking that uh, just that um, whatever it is that, you know, the inspiration or the sense of like a, of competitiveness or a combination of a lot of different things. But I've been on my own, just me tattooing, just me and my client for six years now. And uh, a lot, oh, yeah. a lot you of the all. time, yeah, a lot of the time I really, really miss having someone else around. Luckily, I have this podcast to to at least bounce ideas, but it's not the same as sitting next to you and seeing what you're working on that day. Uh, yeah, so it's um. But then I also see how that could be, um, especially like you said, big egos, big talent. As uh, you know, as days and month, weeks and months go on, uh, I can see how you know, relationships can change and, and maybe you don't, you're not as likely to take advantage of some of those, like yeah. you're less likely to see the guy next to you as inspiration and more likely to see uh competition. I don't know. I think it, it, I think it can go either way. It really makes you explore that part of yourself and figure out how you're going to interpret that. And, you know, it gives you the opportunity to like, you know, also, take that as the, you know, something that helps you be the artist and the person you want to be too. So I, I, I don't know. I think it's better to go through that and take that risk and go through the hard spots. You know, everybody's going to have times where you see somebody else doing something amazing and you're looking at yourself going, fuck, what am I doing? You know, but you, you kind of need a, a good kick in the pants. You need someone to check your ego. You need someone to keep you inspired and, you know, uh, sometimes call you on, on bullshit if you're being a little lazy here or there. You know, it's 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 good to have all that stuff, even if it's not comfortable. I think it's healthy for artists, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. But at the same time, and I, I, I've also been in a position where I've been in some areas in the shop too long. And you have some people that are always good and fun and beneficial to work with. And, uh, and then there's other people that you feel like you kind of have to, you know, that kick in the pants thing. You, you kind of have to do it all the time to get them to kind of come up to a basic bar and not drag everybody down a little bit um you know there really wasn't much of that at guru they've always had a good standard but i think most of us have seen a shop or two like that and that gets tricky too because it's like fuck what am i supposed to you know am i an arrogant asshole for kicking somebody to do better you know am i being like an elitist prick and it, probably a bully in his mind or you know should i give up my standards and not be ambitious because this guy over here is going a little slower or doesn't want to clean up after himself or be a little more professional. And I, I need to just accept that and just be one of those fuck it guys or just kind of whatever, man, fuck it. Let everybody do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a internal battle. I mean, obviously I'm telling my bias little 
rant there which side of that I fall on, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't necessarily miss that part of uh, of having a lot of people at a shop, but I definitely like some people, and you know, some of them stay, some of them don't. I think there's something to that, like being an environment where you kind of have like a 50 50 mix of like kind of constant new blood and then some, some kind of old, uh, you know, weathered artists that are really specialized and know what they're doing. You know, it's a, that, that's a sweet spot. I, I really like being in for a long time. at Kuru. You know, there's a, yeah. you know, I've got my own reasons for wanting to take off out of San Diego, but that was a really good place to be in for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I could, I could see that being true and no doubt that that's a, that that's a nice sweet spot. And, you know, the, um, I don't know to what extent Guru had uh, uh, guests coming through, but a lot of the big shops like that have have a pretty steady stream of guests coming through that add, you know, just something different, you know, week to week when there's when there's someone else is in the shop that's not normally there. I think it kind of has a positive yeah. impact on most everyone, at least in my experience, it did. It does. I mean, that's one of the biggest benefits of working at any shop, especially if they are, you know, high profile enough to get fun people to come through and work with you. And, you know, honestly, even just get anybody, because, you know, I feel like I've had a lot of people that I had no idea who they were just show up out of nowhere and uh, just be not just awesome people, but you always, you know, you can learn something really cool from somebody that you, you know, of course didn't know about or was think was in some way sort of famous or whatever before. But I love that mix. It's just having new people in and, you know, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, a really nice uh, way of getting that without having to necessarily do the craziness of all the conventions and that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, I know when I was at Guru, Guru is really good that we have a lot of guest artists over there, but where I was at, uh, we weren't really exposed to it. We were kind of in this weird spot. We were just sort of put out to pasture in the back and Mm -hmm. sort of not really, uh, not really interacted with anybody, you know, not on purpose, but it just, just sort of happened that way. So that was one of my motivations for leaving. You know, I I really wanted to go work with all these other guys. That's why I'm trying to hit the road now and trying to do this uh, traveling guest artist bit, or at least trying to get that going a little bit before I leave. And, um, you know, sorry, local, but still sort of traveling guest artist, whatever that weird scenario is. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. that about the setup and 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 for people who don't know Guru has two locations and and your location was the Pacific Beach, is that what it is? Pacific yeah. Beach location. And then, and, you, and you were kind of like a, a separate entrance and upstairs off to the side so it was kind of like you wouldn't naturally exactly. even find the spot that you were tattooing. So it was kind yeah. of out of the way. You, I could see how you would feel like you were a little bit out of the mix. Yeah, well, and a big part of it is just that just because of the way the shops happened to be when they were made that, you know, the newer shop, the, the, the newer location was just a little nicer, a little fancier looking. And it also had a little more flexible space. So when artists came in, that's where they went. And usually they don't, they're not going to drive all the way to the other shop. You know, they, they might pop in, but if they do, they just sort of like look in the front or maybe talk to somebody and leave. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it really, I don't know, just stroke a luck the way it worked out, but, uh, but whatever, you know, I'm getting yeah. out and doing a little traveling and, you know, fingers crossed conventions will be a thing again here soon. And I'm going to start yeah. trying to do a little bit of those or go into those. I, I don't even know if I'm actually work at too many conventions, but definitely go. I like the social part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the same way. That's another reason we do this is I'm not a huge fan of, um, uh, of tattooing at conventions, but I like, uh, I like the social part of it. So we, uh, yeah. we bring, we bring cameras and mics instead of tattoo machines. Uh, most of the time I do both. The funny thing about that experience for me is that, um, I, I get there, I'm excited to podcast, but after all day Friday and part of the day, Saturday, I see all these people doing awesome tattoos and I'm talking to them, but maybe I'm judging competitions or doing whatever. And then I just want to do a tattoo by like Saturday afternoon. It's like, man, like everyone else is doing cool tattoos. I'd like to do a cool tattoo. Yeah, it does kind of, it's one of those catch 22 scenarios. Either way you go, you're always going to be thinking you wish you'd done it the other way. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Well, this, um, this series that we've been working on right now is, is kind of about um, illustrative tattooing or storytelling (laughs) within tattooing. So I'd I'd like to, uh, to kind of transition a little bit into that because you have a a recognizable and, and, and unique style that blends a lot of, you know, kind of illustrative organic stuff with a lot of like, bold geometric pattern based stuff sometimes. And uh, I don't really have a specific question to get, to get rolling on it uh, other than maybe how do you approach storytelling? Do you consider storytelling uh, in your work at all? Or um, if not, how do you approach your kind of illustrative style? If you could just start with your, maybe your drawing process or whatever you see fit to start with. 
Yeah, I was excited to see you're doing this series because for me, I feel like um, that's always been the best part of tattooing, in my opinion. And that's not been a very popular opinion. I think over the last couple of popular fads that have gone through five, 10 years, you know, it's been all kinds of other stuff and color portraits and neo trad and other stuff that, you know, while it has its merits is a kind of put illustrative stuff in the backseat. And that's, that's been my, you know, (laughs) that's my jam. That's what I love. Right. Right. I've been going crazy on that. So I was really excited to see her doing that. And that maybe, maybe fingers crossed, even the the general public is going to come back around to appreciating it a little more. Cause I feel like, uh, you know, it's uh, to me, that's in so many ways, it's more expressive, you know, uh, I guess illustrative work is like the definitions get really murky on it. Uh, I always like to ask people when they ask about anything illustrative, like, what does that mean? You know, I know what it means to me. Uh, I always just try to think of it as, you know, how I think most people even now think of it, just stuff that's a little heavier on the drafting side, on the you know drawing skills, refined drawing, not necessarily graphic or shape based drawing or you know even folk art style like a little more like um you know uh just traditional work where it's you know heavy on the the symbolism maybe the the you know, the actual refinement of the picture matters less than the the iconic symbolism of what it is and uh so i think when people talk about illustration they're like okay well i want that or i want to be able to have that but i also want the thing drawn really fucking cool you know mm-hmm. and so that seems to be it i worked with a guy tony uh years ago who was a phenomenally talented you know illustrator, draftsman, drawer, whatever you want to call it. And uh, it's one of those things where he could generally had a lot of people come in asking for cheesy beach tattoos, which most of us would roll our eyes at, and he could make it look fucking amazing. And so that's kind of what I think of as illustration or that set of skills, that drafting skills, because he can take a dolphin and a sunset and this thing we've all done a million times and just don't even want to touch again if we could help it and somehow make it so cool that you kind of want to get it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That, that's yeah. that's the, the the skill and you know the years of hard work he's put in behind it to be able to take a dolphin and make it look really fucking cool or something like that so that's what i think of when i think of illustration is just the higher level of drafting skills and refinement uh, uh that's you know when people come to me and they tell me oh i, want, I like an illustrative uh tattoo or i like something illustrated you did it's usually something that looks more like refined classic art, but it's more line based it's punchy or maybe like the classic golden age of illustration and, you know, magazine cover kind of illustration with that really classical look. Yeah. Uh, even though I, I'd say that's only kind of one arm of what I like to do. Um, yeah. I'd say it's it, probably the hardest, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, but, but it's also the most exciting. Yeah. It's, it's funny that, you know, that, that you're, uh, listening to you kind of like define the illustration for yourself, because whenever I first had the idea for the series, I said, I want to do an illustrative tattooing series. And I want to reach out to some of my favorite illustrative style tattooers. And then I thought that's not descriptive enough. Uh, I want to talk about storytelling through tattooing. Yeah. I want to it's talk more in the, the literal sense of the definition of illustration. Which I, yeah. I also like, I kind of, I go down a rabbit hole and go deep on that sometimes too. Yeah. So, so what I yeah. found is that I was asking myself, like, what makes a, who do I consider an illustrative tattooer that I really like? What makes them illustrative? And I guess the definition that I came up with, or whenever I was, whenever I first had the idea for the series, is when I look at a piece and I feel like I kind of walked in in the middle of something, and there's it, and uh, walked in the, in the middle of a story or in the middle of something happening. And whether I don't know what tells me that, you know, I think just sometimes yeah. I see a character and I feel like I should know more about the character, or I see exactly. something in the yeah, I see it, something. It in draws the you in, and it, it I don't know, just that the implication is more important than mm-hmm. the the literal narrative, you know. Yeah, yeah. Just the, the the implication of what could be is what an illustration is about. You know, it could be this, it could be that. It's the starting point of the story, and if you look at some. Uh, what I think are some of the most successful illustrations, whether it's a movie poster or, you know, something where it kind of has to do a very work driven, literal job and make somebody go see this movie about this kind of thing. Even those are suggestive because they want to get you to go in it. It's not that they don't want to give the movie away, even if they could, you know, probably wouldn't read that way. It's just that they want to pique the interest and bring up a few topics without necessarily having to tell you every every last thing about it. And uh, I think for tattoos, that's actually aside from, the nuts and bolts of what makes illustration work. I think for tattoos, that's important too, because you know how it is. You have people come in and say, I want, you know, this crazy thing happened to me that really changed my life and uh, it's super important to me. And uh, 
I want to get something to represent that. And, uh, you know, so here it is, and you, you could basically do it in the most blunt, literal way. Uh, but it's not only is that a bit boring, but it's also um, not necessarily that helpful to that person because that person wants to get something because that was important to them. Do they do they need or are they obligated to tell that story to everybody that sees it and give it all away? Right. You know, that's a keepsake of a big moment in their life that was impactful. And, uh, you know, other people, again, if it piques the interest, it might start a conversation or it might give context to that person and some event they had or something, but uh, it doesn't have to give everything away either. You know, I think in all of these scenarios by going too far, getting too literal and trying too hard to give every last bit of the story away, uh, we're shooting ourselves in the foot all at the same time, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. So what about take some um, of the pressure off of us too? Yeah. Yeah. What, what about as far as in your, uh, personal work, whether it's in in work that you're creating to sell as tattoos or you're creating for, I actually stared at one of your prints for about eight hours the other day. I was getting tattooed by uh, Andy Chambers and they have um, the, oh, nice. uh, uh, yeah, and they, they've got a, one of the big uh, kind of bodysuit piece. Uh, it's not a body, it's not from the bodysuit thing that you guys did, but it's the one with um, uh, the kind of uh, uh, female kind of devilish woman with the, uh, the kind of ghostly creature behind her or whatever. That's oh yeah. Yeah. The big yeah. blue devil behind her. Big blue devil, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I love that one. Uh, yeah. man, Andy, uh, uh, hit me up because I probably have a better print of that. <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> the prints I had made of that were, were shot and printed after it was like kind of washed out from sitting in the sun for a while. Oh really? So uh, yeah. I actually, yeah, I'm, I'm like in the process of restoring it and reshooting. But anyway, yeah, Andy, okay. I don't know. Well, so I, get you another one. I know. I'll, I'll let him know. I'll let him know to check out the episode. Uh, but so as far as in your, in your personal work, I mean, I think it's interesting that, that one of the first things that pops in your head is that it's more about the kind of implication or the, the like hinting at, uh, at a narrative and letting the viewer kind of fill in the story uh, as opposed yeah. to like literally getting your point across, because that's been one of the questions that I've asked each person in the, yeah. during the series. And I've gotten a few different answers, you know, and um, for the most part, people have the, uh, have had the, um, uh, the same kind of opinion uh, that, that you just described, but uh, Nick Baxter, for example, he has a lot of very like uh, social and, and political and, and, and global kinds of like, he has some specific thoughts and opinions that he um, that are very important to him that when he spends you know, weeks or months or however long it takes to do one of these highly rendered uh, illustrative paintings or tattoos, he would like for the point to be clear to the viewer because he's trying to make that exact yeah. point. You know what well, I mean? Ex exactly. And that's more to that. Uh, that's the word that just gave me editorial, editorial illustration. Uh, right. And so that's kind of the, the school of that right now. And that's, you know, it's certainly not wrong in any way. I'm just saying what, what appeals to me. And I've found that uh, I feel like my journey was really probably a pretty common one for people who are first getting into illustration because as simple as some of that stuff might sound, it's really hard to wrap your head around how to make that work well for you every time. Mm -hmm. And so they, um, you know, you get, just got to battle it for a long time, uh, for years and years until it gets better. And most people start from a place where it is more literal because I think it is, uh, in some ways, it seems easier to wrap your head around, but realistically, as far as workload and the ability to communicate that goes, that's actually uh, much harder, not necessarily always on the picture, but much harder to also have it hit your marks as far as visual appeal. You know, it's got the potential to be so complex that it's unmanageable. And of course, as we grow and we get better at it, we can learn to manage more and get more of those parts working. But I think that most people start from that point where you probably, the interest that, that it peaks in you starts a little more in that, like, you know, very list making and direct narrative form. And then it gets a little more towards the abstract or a little, you know, it learns where it can afford to be loose and not have it affect the soul of the piece, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, then you can also use that same wiggle room you just gave yourself and use that to make it more visually appealing. Use that to get a little more of your visual artistic style in because, you know, we got to hit all our marks all the way across. We got to hit all our standards. We can't just, you know, afford to do just one thing. And of course, not saying that Nick Baxter or anybody else trying isn't, he's obviously killing it, but um, it does make a much different workload. And it can allow you to be more free and sometimes expressive. And for me, that's expression is the key part of it. And of course, I kind of come from this weird spot where my style is 
uh, and everything I've been focused on has always kind of been this weird, like if you see a Venn diagram, it's like a sweet spot between, uh, it would be, you know, classical illustration up here and like cartooning and maybe street art a little bit, you know, and this, uh, this weird kind of spot in the middle where there might even be some sense of caricature involved, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of an overlap where it gets a little bit of each of those things. And, uh, so much of it really comes down to character being the main word. Because uh, if you breathe enough life and character or even, you know, if you've ever looked into books uh, based on that type of illustrations, character creation, which I was also really into, it's just about that. It's about telling uh, not necessarily just a story. It's about telling more than just a story can tell. That's the that's the real power of an illustration. You know, if if it's just a simple sentence or two and we want to be literal about it. Uh, it's kind of cutting it short, you know, pictures and, you know, illustration is at its strongest when it does so much more with the picture than what the words can. It can capture the things that are hard to say otherwise. Mm -hmm. And uh, really that comes down to character and style, personality, expression. You know, I think um, expression is what gives art its credibility in so many ways. That's uh, at least for me, it always has it. You yeah. know, it's the, uh, it's the thing that gets me the most excited. It's the thing that people connect with the most and feel personally. It's just what they remember long term, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an, a, a, an interesting and an important point that I really haven't given a lot of thought to. But a really great illustration can say things that that words on a page probably can't get across in the same way. Um it, you know, it has not the, in the exact yeah, same way. Yeah. It has that potential. I mean, that's really hard to do. That's what I think it takes yeah. a particularly talented illustrator to do. You know, I wouldn't yeah. want you or anybody to go out there and be like, oh, I'm just going to illustrate now and make that happen. It's like, no, man, mo most people, they pull their hair out for 10 years before they can start to make that work. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but that's not amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not to sell um, great storytellers, uh, pe people who use words really well, short, because in the same sense, words can tell stories in the way probably that pictures cannot. They're different. Oh, um, well, yeah. absolutely. And that's what I mean. I just want the, you know, the art form itself to reach its fullest yeah. possible potential for all this, the ways we can use it, whether it's on paper or digital or it's a tattoo, you know, we want to make sure that that visual space, that visual medium is being used to its, you know, maximal ability, really, you know, you yeah. want to make sure you get every last drop out of that tube of toothpaste, you know? Right. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, go, um, if you don't mind, let's, let's run through a little bit of your actual process and whether you want to talk about your process from the standpoint oh, of a, of a client yeah. coming in or, or a piece of art that you're creating out without the influence of a client. I'm, I'm good with whatever. For me, it's a, kind of a, I, I've settled at a three day process and that is mostly meaning that, um, I find that to be where I get the most bang for my buck illustratively because, you know, the basic core idea behind illustration, it's the same as it is for writers or musicians or anybody. If you want to make the good stuff, you have to put more time and effort and focus into it. You know, that's always the key thing. People ask, how do I do this better? How do I that, do that better? They're always looking for a trick or a tip or a piece of equipment that will change it. And then they, we, you know, the cliched thing we always have to tell somebody again is like, no, man, you just got to draw more. You got to learn more about this. You got to study first, do a couple of drafts and then go back into it and not allow yourself that excuse to say, nah, fuck it. I just don't need to do that. I'm just awesome as I am. You know? <laughs> and, um, you know, that, that's the constant battle is trying to figure out how to, again, get the most bang for your buck with that, because, you know, you can't go too far down the tunnel the other way or none of us will ever get anything done. So there has to be this this hinge in the middle, the sweet spot of where it's, you know, as much work as you're getting results for. And so that's where my three day system that I've come to has been because, you know, me, I like to break everything down and yeah kind of uh, batter it in the sort of scientific process sort of manner. You know, I, I tried it the one day system and it went to something more complicated. And then, you know, that, yeah, after a while that didn't work and you go back and forth and back and forth. And so I feel like what I have now is um, probably still a lot more time than most people want to put in, but I also, I don't mind that, you know, I think um, again, kind of going back to the stuff definitions before uh, with illustration, you know, I think, um, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and I feel like that's something we all need to probably think about a little more before we do some of these things is just having a clearly defined idea. And uh, so we kind of have to, in that same way, make up our mind first and say exactly 
what do I want out of this? Exactly. What's my approach? And so I've been thinking, you know, that I have to not just before I start some work, but before even my clients, when they come in, I got to let them know, this is where I am. This is my camp. I'm, I'm somebody who definitely considers myself to be much more on the fine art end of illustrative tattooing. Mm -hmm. And um, rather than that being fancy words is what that really means. is just that uh, I want, to get the best result possible. You know, uh, one of the most important things we can do is figure out where our priorities are. Most of us have usually have the same priorities for the most part. You know, if you had a top five or top 10, most of us are all going to be the same things. But if they are even in a slightly different order, it's going to change everything. It's going to change who you are. It's going to make the decisions, you know, in your life different when two of those things are conflicting. And at some point they will. So knowing where they are and where your priorities are in order helps you figure that out. So that's why I tell people that with uh, the fine art tattooing approach, that means um, I am first and foremost worried about getting the best result possible. Um, I do also like to be a professional. I don't want to waste my time. I need to make enough money to get by and be happy and be a professional. And, uh, you know, a lot of these other things that I would consider to be, you know, very, very important. Uh, are, they're all still very important, but that's kind of the, the top rung. And so is where that changes on the other stuff. It changes on the advice I can give people because uh, I might be able to give somebody a lot of advice and make really good illustrations that is just so impractical to the way they want to do business. It's so impractical because they want to sit down and just do a tattoo and just, you know, shut the door, not go home and do homework, you know, <laughs> not, yeah. not do a day or two of research first and all that. So we have to decide, OK, exactly how much extra work am I willing to put in? Can I afford to do a little more here and a little more there? Um, and so, again, yeah. with that, that's the kind of the, the declaration. Right. That, yeah, I'm, I, I can give you my process. And I can tell you it's probably going to be too much for you or most people, but yeah, yeah. you're welcome to hear. I, yeah. <laughs> and I, yeah. I, I'd like to go through it if we can, if we can bullet point it. Yeah, uh, but, absolutely. But, but I do want to, uh, to your point, I think you're right. I think if you were to, if you were to have people list out what the most important kind of aspects of their work were, they would, we, there would be, you know, a handful of things that were in, in different orders, maybe worded differently, but it's, it's really more about how, how much you care about any of those priorities and how much work exactly. you're willing to put in. And that, that changes everything, man. I've, I've seen that really turn and not even just to where like, you know, you have a couple of artists that are, uh, you know, colleagues or friends or working together on projects where they it can almost turn them against each other. And they sometimes don't even really go back to being cool again afterwards. And they realize they get halfway through something and they're like, oh, but this is way more my priority. That's way more my priority. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, nobody is necessarily right or wrong. It's just, it's helpful to know what part of this massive color wheel of different artist types you fall on so that, you know, basically you can go into that saying, oh, I'm, I'm here and this is my, this is my spot that I'm really happy about right now. Not necessarily that everybody else is wrong. And then if you're going to get advice or you're even going to move to another area, you know, to look for that person and don't take advice from, uh, you know, somebody far off on you know, the other end of the spectrum. You know, I, I've seen that happen a lot where it's great that, especially with YouTube, uh, it's great that people are able to educate themselves and really be motivated and try to learn some new stuff. So they'll go and like, okay, well, I'm going to, uh, you know, really learn how to use color better. So I'm going to go, uh, you know, I'm a traditional tattooer, but I'm going to go learn how to do digital color work from this guy because it's amazing. And then I'm going to go learn how to, you know, do something else that's completely non-applicable to what I'm doing. And it's not that you can't get something good out of these other areas. You just shouldn't go in with the intention of that works for what I'm doing because mm -hmm. that can be problematic. So yeah. again, just knowing, knowing, you know, what you're getting into or where you want to go with it, even if you're not there, if you want to get there eventually, I think that's super, super helpful. So I tell people and my clients first, like, okay, this is what we're getting into. I have a long process where I bet clients beforehand and mostly telling them, you know, my tattoos take longer. I put more time in, I do things in a process that is sometimes very backwards from what, you know, you might expect if you've had tattoos from just the guy down the street or something like that. So uh, I kind of have to explain it all and make sure that they're uh, yeah. not just understanding it, but they're happy with it. I don't want them to feel cornered or ambushed or surprised by the process being entirely different, especially if it's longer and it means more pain and money and effort and all the other pain and ass stuff you got to deal with to get a tattoo. So, sure. sure. Um, well, can you, can you kind of run through just a little bit of your process? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So uh, basically I do uh, three days, usually the first day I'll do uh, kind of rough sketching and um, 
I want to do a lot of thumbnails. You know, uh, I'm very much uh, work off that dashboard and list setup that I think is really common for illustrators and really common for um, digital artists. You know, I, I know anybody who's been to school for character creation, other stuff like that. You know, it's some kind of a dashboard. And what I mean by dashboard is if you're looking at, like, say, your drawing board or a giant blank piece of paper that was bigger than what you need to draw on. Um, you know, like say if I was the picture in the middle here, you would on off on one side, you have the list of the things this picture has to be, you know, the list of, you know, it's a duck with a hat that's doing this or whatever, you know, you get your list of the, this character needs to be this or that. You've got the list up above your standards and your, your marks, you know, that you uh, kind of always keep across the top of the dashboard. And that's so you can constantly visually check in and be like, okay, this is the color pattern, right? Is the tone pattern, right? Is the, uh, you know, does it read well from the distance I need? Is, is the scale too large or too small? You know, whatever it is that you need to constantly remind yourself of, you know, because we all have those things. We do a picture and we kind of get in our sweet spot and we go all the way through it. And um, we look back at it and go, oh, that's really cool, but I should have made it bigger, which is also the exact same thing I said to myself for the last three years for every drawing I've done. Because, uh, you know, you didn't visually see it during the process, you know, you're, you're not constantly having an eyesight, so you're not checking it. Anyway, that's, that's the dashboard. So you put the things you need to kind of constantly remind yourself of up there, you know, and, uh, and you kind of work off of that. And so, you're doing um, that in a, in a, in mostly with text, with bullet points, or, or with little illustrations and thumbnails? Um, I actually have it even just like this, like little post-its and other stuff on my drawing board. Because I, I do tend to do a lot of, um, you know, just actual analog, real physical drawing right and uh so my drawing board very much has that it'll just have post-its like oh need, don't forget it needs to be this you know it, for me especially lately it's been focusing a lot more on the, the you know i don't know if you're the classic the three distances you know you need something to be readable and good from close medium and far you know mm -hmm. you know a foot away 10 feet away 100 feet away and it has to if it fails at any one of those three distances it fails as a whole right and, uh, you know, so that is uh, something I learned early on, but I still have to remind myself of. So I, I've always had that one on the list and I try not to put too many up there so it doesn't get overwhelming. But there's usually, you know, five, maybe 10 tops. And um, so that way at every stage through, I check, I check my work, I check my work, I make corrections. And uh, ultimately, that's why I came to a three day process. So I have room, I have a day to, to stop, think on it, flip it, check it, check my work, you know, that kind of thing. So likely some of these requirements or some of the, the um, notes on your dashboard came from the client's um, request or the client's requirements. And some of them are based on what the client has told you. Some of them are just what you know from years of tattoo. The, the client wouldn't, wouldn't say it needs to look good from 20 feet away. Exactly. You, you might have some bullet points about things that were important. Exactly. To the and that's what the, the list on the side is just that. That's for that in particular, uh, that job in particular. And that's what okay. it needs to be. It's requirements. So that, that would be what, you know, the client brings to you or you decided I'm going to make this character and it needs to have this, 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 and this. And that's over here. So I can make sure that I'm getting everything as I do different drawings or thumbnails. But the ones across the top are the ones that are more my personal choices, my, my personal aesthetic. That's why they're, you know, they can be different for everybody and they can constantly change. But it's really helpful to have them right above eyeline as you're drawing. So it's a constant reminder of, of you to check in. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really how you develop, I think, a personal style more than anything. Um, mm -hmm. I know people ask you about that a lot. They ask you, well, how do I get a style? It's like, you know, 10,000 hours. Just do that real quick. Right. You know, 10,000 hours of drawing. Just do it right now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, but that does help a lot. That things like this and having uh, lists and having a good, efficient process that, like, is helpful. It's not just giving you extra steps. You know, it always seems like extra steps at first until you get used to it. But uh, you know, you can trim out the extras, you do that, you can trim that 10,000 hours probably into 7,000 hours or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, it does help a lot. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, these are habits I've gotten into, but that's a big part of it. So I get my three days is basically, I'll usually start with a lot of thumbnails. I like to do a list first, make sure I know mentally, I know what it needs to be. I like to do a thumbnail, um, or two or three or five, uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. You know, just basically try to get it visually interesting before it's large enough to see what it is. You know, same basic thumbnailing process most people do. And I know that gets skipped a lot in tattooing. Lot. And really, yeah. I mean, every artist knows they should do it and then they never do it. Uh, I'm not guilty of that. I, I would say I probably still only do it half as much as I should, but I really try. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do like to do it that. And then once I find a shape, a pattern, uh, 
And I try to do those together, shape and pattern, uh, meaning uh, tone pattern, like light, dark, light, dark, where, you know, what shapes are dark, what shapes are light. I think that you should have a good idea of what those are before you start the actual drawing, get the characteristics of what it is. Uh, and then uh, I'll kind of do a, a real rough, something real rough and loose. And that kind of comes more from my animation and character creation background. Um, I want to give it enough room to be as expressive as possible and have as much movement as possible and be able to change it if we need to. So I try to get the whole shape, you know, scribble real wide as, you know, a lot of times I still do tracing paper, like the old animation style, you do a page, you flip it, you do a page, make corrections, flip it, you know, that kind of thing. And um, are you that's really helpful. Much, uh, are, are, you, are you using much visual reference at this point? Have Absolutely. You any reference? Okay. Uh, I am, but that's actually, uh, and that, that was, probably one of the most important things I learned. I mean, everybody, I think at some point really struggles with how or when or why to use reference. Uh, but for me, I did like, I think most people did and I relied too heavy on it too early. Mm -hmm. And I found that basically if I go to my reference before I have my thumbnails and my sketches done, it kind of creates a groove in your mind about how something is or should look. And even if you want to try to disregard it, it's kind of like stained in your brain a little bit and it's impossible to get rid of at a certain point. Mm -hmm. So even if you come up with something that objectively might have been cooler, you're so focused on that stain or getting away from the stain even that it kind of hampers your process or it just comes out really stale and repetitive. And um, so I found that even though it does tend to be faster and easier to go at it the other way and have visual reference first, uh, that's why uh, everybody, and well, I wouldn't say everybody, so often tattooers, illustrators, everybody, you know, they got the, you know, same face syndrome. You got the same, same hands in the same positions, the same objects doing the same things. And the formulas are all the same. And sometimes it is because somebody's like, oh, that is my style, which, you know, as we also know, that very often is the excuse for I'm not going to grow. This is just what I do. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, even for those who are really refined and doing that really well, uh, just, some people feel really trapped by it. And, uh, you know, very few people in the end, long term, are super happy with it and want to be there. And the main way to get away from that is by not getting that little stain in your brain to begin with, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. you want to uh, try to do your other stuff first and then use reference as a way to sort of grade your own test, to look at it and be like, Oh, is this, is this a coyote? Well, you know, it looks a little more like a wolf or a bear, or a badger in the sketch. I didn't realize until I see the real thing. Now I can use this to make corrections and make sure that again, going back to the word character, it's probably the biggest key word you could really pull out of the whole thing. Uh, and really focus on getting the character of that right, making sure that that, you know, also has life and expression and movement and, uh, you know, using the chance to get reference to also find that. So, again, if it was a coyote, it's like, oh, well, it makes a coyote really exciting. Maybe the way he springs when he finds a mouse or, you know, he does some like little things rather than the, the really textbook. If especially if we go directly to reference, you find the textbook, oh, three quarter turn face. That's it. We're just going to draw it that way or whatever. Right. Um, which again, ultimately it's fine, but most of the time those get a little repetitive and sometimes boring and it's not helping you grow. And it's also not helping get you closer to, again, squeezing the last little bit of toothpaste out of that tube, you know, getting every last bit out of the, the visual space that you're allowed to work with. You know, you want to make the absolute most out of it if possible. Yeah. So I think that's how we do it. And so I move from there. I do the reference to, to try to check everything. And then uh, let's see my list here. Yeah, I'll do the, the rough sketches. I'll do a little research and reference afterwards. And I do quite a bit of that. Mm -hmm. uh, with my clients, I'll very often put 10, 20 hours of research in. You know, most of the stuff I'm doing is pretty big and sometimes pretty laborious. Uh, sometimes the reference is because I need to know more about something. Sometimes it's because I need to fact check it. Because a lot of things we think we know about something are not really not only is it maybe not that accurate, but it's very often not as exciting as the weird dark truths you might find out about something. You know, uh, one I really liked doing more recently is a collaboration with my friend, uh, Joe, who still works at Guru Tattoo. Mm -hmm. And um, it's on a friend of ours, Bart, and uh, it's uh, Athena and her owl. And uh, that's a theme we've all oh. seen a lot of times, but we wanted to find a way to kind of bring it home, not just to make it more appropriate for what he wanted it for, it's for his daughter and wanted not to be, uh, you know, kind of cheesy or, you know, overly sexualized or anything like that. But then it started digging into it and finding more, some of the darker points about some of the, uh, you know, the, the patterns and, you know, the type of owl, basically, you know, how she's supposed to be more related to, uh, you know, something that's a little more demure and that kind of thing. And that might not be, 
that big of a difference to me, but obviously it meant the world to him. So I think going to all the trouble of fact checking and reading a number of stories on those before I started any sketching, that went a long way. Day one, uh, I'll do that. I like to sleep on it. And I think that's really important. It helps me, it, well, it helps me do two things. It helps me get away from it so that I can rest my eyes and look back again with kind of fresh eyes. A lot of times I'll flip it or reverse it and then do my next drawing backwards. Uh, but really a big part of it is that it makes doing this much work manageable. It makes it manageable for your schedule. It makes it where it's not intimidating or you don't burn out. So, you know, if I have, uh, you know, uh, an outline on Sunday, I can say, well, I'm going to do drawing starting on Wednesday and then I'll do the next part on, you know, Thursday or Friday and the next day, you know, the days don't have to be back to back. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes even having a little space in between is really good for it. A uh, little space, not a lot of space, but mm -hmm. um, it makes the, you know, just building out your schedule manageable as far as being able to do all this extra build up work before the actual tattoo starts yeah. and uh, not feel like you have an eight hour night yeah. of homework and then you know basically the five day work week turns into an eight day work week yeah. you know yeah so um, so at, so at the end of day one you have made notes and you have those on your dashboard you've done thumbnails uh, maybe you uh, put together a rough comp composition and you've done uh, research at the end of day one yeah research and reference and then i'll uh, basically the next day when i get back to it that's when i i again go to the top of the dashboard you know, whatever I have hanging above my drawing area there. And I say, okay, is it hitting this? Is it doing that right? Is it doing that right? Also check my list. Did we forget anything? Do, can we get rid of something even to make it simpler? You know, that kind of thing. Check your work and streamline it and fix it, flip it around. And then I'll do a little more detailed drawing. Uh, I'll do, yeah, any, any corrections. Uh, and then uh, the first rough sketch I always try to draw with the shadows and block those as much as I do the lines. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really important again for that toe, uh, sorry, the, the tone pattern, uh, figuring out, you know, especially if it's a sleeve or something that wraps around a 3D object, uh, whatever you do on paper or flat surface can't entirely be trusted to look, you know, the same. You can get an idea, but you have to know that you also, even in making the sketch or in the tone pattern, you can't finish the whole thing. You, you know, you have to know where to leave it unfinished so that, you know, if or when you have to get creative to make sure that not only that it fits, but also the tone pattern still works and that, uh, you know, one important object doesn't cover up another important object or something like that, you know, that, so you kind of have to break it up that way. Um, but then, yeah, sorry, second day, I'll get to doing detailed drawings. I'll get to where I'll do a fully more rendered like tone pattern. Uh, I'll figure out basically what pieces, if it is going to be big, especially a sleeve or a back, uh, I've gotten really good at figuring out um, how I can break things into puzzle pieces rather than trying to make one big stencil because that, um, I wouldn't say it never works, but it always disappoints when it goes on the body, when it fits, uh, it doesn't really map onto the person in the correct way. So the way I apply stuff is that I will usually draw on a person. You can do a sleeve say, you know, you'll figure out, okay, I'm going to draw a big circle where I want my focal point here. Here's a big problem area. I'll kind of make some weird marks on that. So I know it's there, you know, uh, make sure that the flow is generally going this direction. I want the cap to reach up this high, you know, basically all the major events marked out with marker. And then I will figure out on day two, after having done that in the consultation, I can look at the drawing, the picture I have with just marker drawings on them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll send you a picture of something similar to that, at least, so you can kind of see a little bit of what that looks like. Yeah. Cool. Uh, very often, it just looks like scribbles or possibly very bad tribal. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but it gives you a, basically just a map of the body and uh, figure out the tone maps, too. You can figure out where it's going to be okay to have something dark and light and not mud into it or roll into an armpit. Um, but then I'll break that on day two, the, the drawings into shapes that fit, will fit into those big things that I've drawn. Mm -hmm. And uh, that makes it not only fit on the body better, but it means that I don't have to have one massive stencil that's not going to work when it goes across the dip or the, you know, in the arm or the lower back or an elbow or any of these spots anyway. You know, if there is a shape that falls across that and it looks good, I can figure out how to do it. But for the most part, my big stencils look like... Um, puzzle pieces that are just attached at, at critical points, mm -hmm. you know, where it has to have a shape be continuous or it has to make sure it goes across here or there. And uh, so I also end up doing um, a lot less it means that you can do a bigger piece that has better looking borders and stuff like that too. Cause usually I'll do like the outline, you know, my process, a lot of layering and uh, again, getting deep into extra time and stuff that may not be practical for everybody, but I do like to gray line a piece first. 
Mm-hmm. Um, it really, really ups the quality, really does. And uh, but it's a lot of work. You know, same thing. I explain that to the client. I make sure they always have the option if they don't want to do it. I totally get it. Uh, but it allows us to make sure that you know um, shapes going across like a bicep might have more of a corner than you thought it did, or something like that. Don't totally get ruined, or if they are off a little bit, you can make corrections on it and stuff like that. So anyway, that's that's the puzzle piece as part of my day too. I make the second day drawings ballpark in those shapes you know things change so i try not to get tied in too hard to that um and then uh, basically at that point again i'm really focused on the character of the piece you know regardless even if it's just a pattern or an object an inanimate object a toaster or something you can find a way to not necessarily animate it but give it the feel of character and life and movement and expression and uh so that's you know like you'd hear in cartooning the push and pull you know you're really trying to or, or just trying to push a character in general to you know make the if the expressions kind of smiling can you make it bigger can you make it more exciting is it at least appropriate to but you know can you even to begin with and uh so i try to do that so again we're dialing it in using those same things from kind of across my drawing space and, uh, and then I kind of do the same thing after that. I sleep on it, you know, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll let it sit. Uh, you know, I'll, uh, very often I want to check the narrative and that kind of thing and just make sure I'm not missing something that's not just important to that piece, but also to that client or just to me. Uh, but then I'll, I'll sleep on it. I'll flip it around back again the other way. So it goes back to the first way that it was day one. And that's when I do the final drawings and the final, you know, uh, it, you know, very often I'm still making a, uh, tracing paper, version with, uh, you know, with marker and that kind of thing to get a really clean stencil off of. Uh, but I do use the iPad too and some stuff for that. You know, sometimes you can just take a snapshot of that and get a clean tracing. But um, very often, I've kind of gone back and forth to that. And I think in the last maybe year, two years, I've settled back into staying away from the iPad, uh, or at least for that particular step. Because I was, um, I've always been an early adopter, you know, I, as far as digital stuff goes, I had a, a, you know, Wacom and a lot of stuff I was familiar with from being in school for animation. I was really excited to use them early on. And I think I kind of did it so much that um, I found that like, even just my process, having the dash across the top, and it seems like something innocuous or just kind of bullshit extra I didn't need to bother with. And over the years, I was finding it's like, oh, I really did need that thing up there. I really did need a way to see that, you know, over here. And I don't always draw, especially now that it's on an iPad more so than it is on, you know, the full desktop setup like a Wacom. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't see the reminders. And so at least for me, that's really helpful to actually see those. But if I'm actually drawing, you know, an actual analog drawing, um, it's much easier for me to make sure that it's to scale. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the big things also on my dashboard for me personally, it's just really hard to not, overdraw something or get too much detail, get it too small. Mm -hmm. Even if those details are just shading details and not line details, they still need to be considered. And um, it's really hard, you know, so the most successful I've always been with it is when I draw very small, I basically figure out everything I need to do. And I do it at half or a quarter of the size of what it needs to be in the end. And then I blow it up at the very end and Mm -hmm. try to keep it as true to the small drawing as possible. Yeah. Because things have a way of getting more detailed over time, but the the digital just because you know so inherently just zoom and pinch and move and mm-hmm. as convenient as that is, uh, even if you constantly try to remind yourself, at least for me, it, it's really hard to keep that part of it. It just kind of um, I, I I completely too often it gets away from me. Yeah. You know, I I completely agree with that, and I, I I fight with it constantly, and I draw almost exclusively between the Cintiq and the and the iPad, and even my thumbnails. I have a thumbnail template with most parts of the body on it, with like six. You know, it's like a three rows of three, so I can just thumbnail out quickly. And even no matter how much I'm telling myself not to zoom in, I'll block in a shape and then I'll zoom in to refine a little bit of it just without exactly, anything. Yeah. About it. That's what I would impossible. do all the time, you know, yeah. to the point where I would have to catch myself halfway through and decide, oh my God, do I want to do this all over now? Or am I just going to try to fudge it and uh, just make it work, which, yeah. you know, yeah. sadly I've done more than I'd like to say. And the whole time thinking to myself, I wish I'd just redrawn it yeah. <laughs> in a physical analog drawing. So I've kind of yeah. gone back to that. And I, so I still like the digital stuff. And uh, very often I still, um, 
I like to do the first step analog. I like to do the last step analog. A lot of the stuff in the middle, especially when it comes to characters, you want to push, you know, your character and you want to uh, reshape things and move them. And especially when you're doing the puzzle parts where you might have to physically use transform or something a little bit and make sure it doesn't distort your object or even if you want to distort it, that's incredibly helpful to have. So, you know, this, at least for me, this is like kind of the, perfect sandwich of those different elements. You know, I use the parts that I really need to in analog because they have to be analog, the parts that really have to be digital or digital. And I feel like I've done a pretty good job of trimming out the extras that I don't need. You know, it, I did spend a long time going back and forth with a lot of these things and uh, it's come down a lot. And I know that's, again, like I said, when we first went in, it's a lot. <laughs> the process sounds like a lot, yeah. but when you, you know, when you get used to something, any process, uh, mm-hmm. it uh, it actually goes really fast and easy. Especially when you break it up to three days, it keeps yeah. the the pressure and the the kind of stress and anxiety that sometimes a big project or even a small project can have. Uh, it can just be overbearing, especially for whatever reason. If sometimes you know we all hit something where it sounds easy, you said yes to it to the client, said yes, this will be awesome. You sit down to try to draw it, and you just can't for the life of you make it fucking look good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? yeah. So you know that kind of thing. So yeah. this also helps a lot with that, or even just plain old. You know, I've been on vacation for two weeks, and I haven't drawn, and you know, in too long, and uh, now everything's coming out kind of stuttered and slow. Well, mm-hmm. three day process. It really yeah. helps with all of these things. I mean, it solves a lot of problems at once. So sure, that's sure. why I've gone to such a complicated process over time. It's really out of every one of these steps has been out of necessity. Yeah. You know, I, the, I've very often tried to cheat away around it and then suffered in the end and gone back to it. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, I think the, the most important thing to, to consider if, if, if for anyone who thinks that that's uh, overkill from a process standpoint is, is that you are not facing uh, the same type of challenges on tattoo day that a lot of people are, because all of your biggest problems are already solved by the time you're placing a stencil and starting a tattoo, where at, exactly. at that point you're, you're dealing with a whole new set of issues with whether it's your, your, you know, your client and their kind of whatever drama they brought something, you know, the differences in skin type cartridges, not, you know, going through three cartridges before one lets ink run out of it properly. You're like all the technical junk that goes along with tattooing. Uh, yeah, you have to deal with that anyway. Uh, you know, you're going to have to deal with that on tattoo day. So if you don't have to deal with drawing on top of that, or problem exactly. solving. And that's why I think having a, having all the stuff thought out this well in advance uh, saves you so much stress and anxiety because ta- the actual act of tattooing is hard enough on its own. Sure. So you, when you do want to sit down, you want to be able to sit down and like, okay, now my job is just this part. I don't have to worry about how does this look? How does it go? What color is it going to be? How heavy do the lines need to be? All of that stuff has been already figured out. So you just sit down and go through it. And, yeah. uh, you know, my stuff is like you were saying, that that's a lot more complicated than what a lot of people are going to need. You know, if they do portraits, uh, they aren't going to need any of this. Mm-hmm. If they do traditional, they definitely won't need much of it, or they may not get as much out of a, a really long drawn out process. Uh, but for people who want to, get more character out of their work or people who want to just dive deep into the heavy illustrative, you know, world. And that's, I, I think something of this type is really good. And I would suggest yeah. anybody don't start with all of it. This is my process that I've, like I said, I, each of these steps has been taken out and put back in after finding that it was absolutely necessary, but everybody kind of has to build their own. You know, I've, this is honestly pretty close to what I've seen some other artists do usually more illustrators than tattooers. Mm-hmm. Um, but really in the end, you have to find your own anyway, and you got to start small. You know, you might want to start with just a basic three day concept, uh, really, you know, allowing yourself the time to prioritize, like I said, those top five things, you know, for me, like I said, you know, as far as what I want to do in order, if I do my, uh, you know, the thumbnails, make a list first and then do the thumbnails and then do the sketch and then do the reference. Uh, it, it's a different recipe. You know, you can do, you can try switching those elements around. And I did a lot of that for years too. And that's where I landed because I found that's where I get the best work. Uh, I know other people do okay. Can, you know, doing this in different orders sometimes. Uh, but until you try it, you don't know for sure. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think that process will be super helpful to a lot of people who watch this, that, uh, that don't have a process. They might find the value and just making notes. So many people don't make notes about what they're looking for out of a piece yeah, before, or even just do extra drawings. You know, I always end yeah. up with two or three drafts before something. And, you know, I, I know, uh, I watched, uh, was it with Nick? I watched one of your other, or Teresa. Uh, she's, mm-hmm. she's great. She's always got a yeah. really good way of getting through, uh, figuring out her own system too. 
yeah. getting amazing results, obviously. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, in a similar way of just, um, just knowing, I guess, really what you want to get out of it and doing some of the work first, doing two or three drafts first and finding a system that works for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't remember offhand now that I'm thinking about it. I don't know if she said she does two or three. I know somebody you, you talked to did. Uh, that's rich, very common rich, for me. Rich Red. That's what, rich Red. Okay. That yeah. might have been. We were talking about thumbnailing and he was saying, I don't do a lot of thumbnails, but I will draw the thing four different times. But he also, yeah. I mean, he just draws fast and he draws similar types of things a lot. He draws yeah. kind of uh, witch's hands and chalices. And so a lot of the elements are similar. So he he really has a lot of the, a lot and of- And he was saying he has, the, he has a huge background as far as that type of art goes too. So, you know, yeah. thumbnailing, uh, I still feel like thumbnail is one of the most important disciplines we can teach ourselves, mm-hmm. but I know it's one of those things especially a really experienced artist can get away from. Yeah. Uh, I, one of the things that I've found is that, uh, again, one of the things that's more on my dashboard on the top in the last four or five years, and I'm still struggling and trying really hard with is just to have very structured, uh, very well thought out, super readable shapes. Again, it's at three distances or just even okay. if you can't tell what something is just, you know, from across the room, uh, each, not only should the shape stand out from each other, but the tone as far as light and dark should stand out from each other. The colors, if it has colors, should stand out from each other to where it looks purposeful and it looks like it has something interesting going on, even if you can't necessarily see what it is. It's that readability. And uh, that that's where I think the thumbnails actually come in more than anything is that it's all about the readability. It's all about the composition. You know, it's very easy to get really myopic with any drawing get focused in. It's like I start here and I'm going to draw out, you know, I'm doing a face and something else. You do the eye you do the other parts just how you want them and the rest kind of grows from there. And that's an interesting process, but uh, yeah. the details, if they come before the shape, at least for everything that I've seen, and I've heard this from a lot of other people too, that, that, you know, the overall composition is not getting all that it should, you know, it's not yeah. necessarily bad. I mean, Rich obviously does great tattoos. So, I mean, I can't knock anything that he does, but that's been the general consensus from most people is that the composition isn't as powerful and striking as it could be if I had a thumbnail that meant the same thing. Yeah. You know, if I had played with the reversing the shapes or moving around or just even changing the scale and size on them a little bit, you know, that's all thumbnails are for just saving yourself a ton of time. So you don't have to do two or three drawings necessarily. You know, I still do anyway. And I think most people still do in the end too, but they end up being very partial, you know? Yeah. I know you yeah. talked on there about your process with the, uh, the clients and how they, you know, when, when they come in and um, review the artwork and what they're asking for. And that was one of the things I found particularly interesting about uh, Teresa and <laughs> the way she's doing it, mm-hmm. saying how, uh, you know, she's just making work and just people pick it up. And that, that's, yeah. that's amazing. That's yeah. somewhere where I think a lot of us wish we could be. Would in love so to be. Ways. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But uh, I, I've had a bit of that. I would say I was about to 50, 50 with that for a short while. And I actually went back and that, that more is probably more personal for me just because I really, enjoy i feel like i get the most out of my illustrations if i am getting the input from another person i tell people even if they have a ton of ideas and uh they say i want you to do your thing i want to collect something i still tell them give me all your ideas just know that we're not probably going to use them we're going to basically throw them in a pot let the ideas stew i've got a wait list and i do several consultations with somebody a few months apart before we actually start so that sounds weird but it's really purposeful and it really helps let those ideas turn into something better. The parts, you know, very often that people tell you where they just felt it so much, they just had to tell it to you, but they can, even themselves maybe can't visualize it in a good way. They need to get that off their chest and they need to be heard and you need to hear them see kind of where they're coming from. And if I can help them take that idea and follow it a little further back the trail of where it came from to the core idea, you know, maybe we can illustrate that. But if you can't, Screw it, man. Just throw it in the pot. Throw all the ideas in the pot. Let's say, we're not going to worry about what it is. I just want to hear all your ideas. Tell me everything. We'll let them stew. And then we'll meet again in like two or three months. And after we've both done a little bit of looking at ideas and thinking about this, and the best ideas always have a way of rising to the top and finding ways where they can kind of work together and cross together and simplify and build into something bigger and better. You know, it really turns into something not just more unique, but more well-suited to their task. And so that's a really interesting and fun process. I like that part of it. And uh, that way it also makes sure that everybody's well heard. They're getting what they want. And the er- artistically, I'm also getting to make the the decisions that I want to make, you know, yeah. I'm getting to figure out exactly how it looks, where it goes, what type, what style, what's going to go with what. I'm, I've got all my sort of art recipes figured out on how I want to put everything together. 
And then, you know, if at that point I can make sure that they know that they're well heard and then, you know, very often we'll even sort of relax and maybe let go of the thing that wasn't afterwards as important as they first thought it was, then, uh, then we can move on and kind of get back to doing things, you know, the other way. Yeah. So yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Look, there's one thing I've been asking, uh, most, most everyone, and then we'll probably call it, uh, is, um, is there any piece you mentioned the Athena piece? Is there any piece in particular that you feel like is a oh, great yeah. example that you've done lately of a uh, of of an illustrative style that might that, that lends itself to the conversation or the theme of this entire series? There is, I think, uh, one or two that might be a little more um, leaning slightly more literal. I guess is uh, just like I did a vanity piece a little while ago. I'll send you a picture of that. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I until I got this camera I'm using here today, I've been doing a, uh, an astoundingly bad job of taking photos <laughs> yeah. or putting anything out in any way. So most right. of the stuff I have to show is either uh, a little bit older or at least in progress. So I, I could, I can definitely send you some pictures, you know, I'd have some yeah. examples of different textures and black and gray, but maybe we'll do another one sometime on some of that stuff. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, either way, I'll send you a picture of this one and it's based on vanity and, uh, you know, it's the same thing. It applies kind of a fun, fun idea, fun feel, you know, it's kind of a nod to some of the uh, ideas he brought me in the reference, but we sort of, again, through that same process, let the ideas stew and brought it down to something that has a feel that it implies some of that, uh, you know, a couple of the pieces that visually look fun together. It's uh, got patterns that work well, Good, you know, flow over the whole body, black and white pattern works well, but ultimately, you know, I want the first thing in even if possibly the only takeaway that somebody gets a quick look at it gets is just that it kind of implies a sense of sort of a narrative about vanity, not just the most literal sense of vanity, but like maybe kind of gets you thinking about it a little bit, you know? So I'll, yeah. I'll plug that yeah. one in there for you. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd be great. Well, sweet, man. I think uh, we'll, we'll probably <laughs> wrap it there. Maybe we can do another one soon. I'd love to talk about uh, uh, textures, black and gray. And I know the last time we talked, yeah. we, did, we did a good bit about how you get some of the really smooth kind of gray, uh, uh, yeah, and great we definitely and things like get that, into a little can, bit yeah. of that and more of the why behind it. I know we talked a yeah. little bit last time. That's part of why I got this camera set up here mm -hmm. is that I uh, might be doing a couple of uh, short bits just on why. Yeah. You know, yeah. why this? Why? Why that? Why? Why is this important? Why? You know, why should you try to do that? But even uh, probably more importantly is that I need to do a little bit. that's almost like a glossary in a book. You know, like we're talking about illustration today. There are so many things where a lot of tattooers are having really difficult conversations because we're saying the same things and we're using different words. Yeah. And so is the public when they come to talk to us and it gets really confusing. So maybe if I just did a little, you know, yeah. two to three minute bit about, hey, this is what at least I think this means when I say this, when people say that. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about, you know, saturation or illustration or some of the stuff that's going to uh, apply. So I, I might do little segments of that. So maybe that's something that'd be, be cool. useful to you or viewers later. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Anything like that you put out, we'd be happy to to share and help promote. That'd be super cool. So uh, cool, man. Sounds like cool, be fun. Man. Yeah. Yeah. And for everyone watching, we'll be sure to link to uh, Coop's work, uh, portfolio, website, all that stuff in the in the show notes uh, below. But uh, man, thanks. It's really good to catch up. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. good to talk to you, man. Yeah, we'll All see right. you soon. Hey, thanks again for watching. If you haven't already, we ask that you would subscribe to our channel so you can stay up to date with new episodes. Also, if you've gotten any value out of our show at all, we would be honored if you would buy us a beer at our Patreon link. And uh, finally, if you'd like to visit our website and sign up for our newsletter, you can find out where we are going, if we're going to be in a town near you, maybe tatting at a convention or something like that. And uh, while you're there, you can pick up some fireside merchandise like a new t-shirt or a hoodie or a coffee mug. Thanks again.